Have you ever wondered what it was like living in Europe during one of the most deadly pandemics in history? Well, buckle up and prepare yourself for the gross story about the gruesome hygiene during the Black Plague. The bubonic plague decimated the Middle East, Asia, and Europe in the 14th century, causing the death of over 50 million people in Europe alone. But how did hygiene practices play a role in managing this epidemic? Let's find out. Travel back to the 14th century Europe with your loofah, where fleas, rats, and lice thrived in filth, spreading disease from rats to humans. Despite this, people slept on straw bedding, unaware of the risks. In the 14th century, Europe was dirty and people didn't bathe every day. Despite this, most peasants washed their hands and face. Rich people had private tubs and everyone else used public baths or streams. During the plague, bathing in vinegar and rose water was recommended as a treatment, and vinegar was considered a useful tool to stop it. Plague doctors even used vinegar to wash their hands or place vinegar sponges in their masks. Urine bathing was also suggested. In medieval times, making soap required various ingredients and skills. Urine may have seemed like a simpler choice for washing compared to the complex soap-making process. The Jewish population had a lower mortality rate during the plague due to their hygiene practices, while some Christians accused them of causing the disease and punishing them brutally. Despite popes declaring Jews innocent, mobs persecuted them and forced false confessions. Christians refused to learn from their healthy neighbors and instead believed in unfounded ideas. The Jewish community faced oppression and vilification during this time. The Nuremberg Chronicle tells of a tragic event in 1348 when all Jewish residents in Germany were burned, accused of poisoning the wells during a plague outbreak. However, this accusation seems baseless as Jewish hygiene practices required more hand washing than their Christian counterparts, potentially leading to lower infection rates. During this time, doctors had no effective treatment for the plague and often worsened the disease through misguided attempts. Such attempts included cutting open buboes and applying a mixture of plant roots, resin, and dried feces. Some even recommended drinking the drained pus from buboes, a fatal suggestion. These historical events highlight the importance of evidence-based medical practices and the consequences of baseless accusations. Europeans attempted to avoid contracting the plague by staying away from the infected, including those who had passed away. The disposal of countless cadavers was a major challenge for towns and cities during the outbreak. According to Giovanni Boccaccio, a 14th century Italian writer, people died in the streets every day or night. Others who died at home often went unnoticed by their neighbors until the smell became unbearable. In Florence, citizens were preoccupied with burying the dead during this time. Sanitation policies were established by Europeans to bury infected bodies in mass graves located outside of towns in deep pits. However, the task of keeping up with the body count was never ending, leading to overwhelmed cities and dogs dragging cadavers back into the streets. Some burial sites were so poorly covered that dogs devoured the cadavers. In medieval times, the lack of indoor plumbing led to a public health hazard as townspeople shared one toilet and had to deal with overflowing cesspits during floods. Some resorted to emptying chamber pots in the streets, adding to the unsanitary conditions. Rats are known to consume any food available, including contaminated food mixed with feces. The presence of rats in open sewers, along with other vermin, aided in the transmission of diseases. As a result, England's parliament realized the connection between waste and illness and attempted to prohibit waste dumping into water sources in 1388. The parliament declared that the excessive amount of garbage, entrails, and filth in the water caused the air to become corrupt and infected, leading to intolerable diseases. During the 14th century, Europeans believed that unpleasant odors caused disease. They carried fragrant flowers and pomanders in an effort to combat the plague. Doctors wore an iconic bird-like mask that held dried roses, mint, and spices believed to offer protection. The costume included a full-body covering, which inadvertently acted as a medieval hazmat suit. While the herbs and spices may not have had any actual effect, the covering likely helped protect the doctors from infection. 
Also, in the 14th century, choices were limited for consumers, as civilization had not yet reached the age of production. However, the Black Plague offered three distinct options, bubonic, pneumonic, and septicemic. The bubonic plague spread through flea bites and affected the lymphatic system. Pneumonic entered the lugs via aerosolized bacteria, while septicemic infected the blood directly or through the lungs or lymphatic system. Survival rates varied between the types, with bubonic at 25-75%, to 75%, pneumonic at 5-10%, to 10%, and septicemic with a mortality rate of 99-100%. to 100%. It was essentially unstoppable, making it a deadly force to be reckoned with. Interestingly, the septicemic plague is still largely fatal despite hundreds of years of medical progress. The septicemic plague is difficult to catch, which is a plus. Of course, your chances increase if you do something foolish. In the 14th century, bloodletting was one of the most widely used medical procedures. Bleeding was used on plague patients as a treatment for fevers by doctors in order to remove heat from the body. Doctors thought that the blood was infected by the plague, which was partially accurate. In order to allow the disease to leave the body, they advised cutting open veins. But the medical care also made doctors and others susceptible to the septicemic plague. Very bad luck indeed. Europeans frequently covered their floors with rushes or straws in the 14th century. The dirt floor in their homes of the poor was covered with straw, and the bottom layers could last for decades, even though wildflowers were occasionally incorporated into them and the top layer occasionally changed. The bottom layer of many homes, sometimes left undisturbed for 20 years, contains exportations, vomiting, and the leakage of men and dogs, ale droppings, scraps of fish, and other abominations not fit to be mentioned. This disturbed Erasmus, a Dutch philosopher and Christian scholar in the 16th century. He claimed that the vapor released by these vile rushes was harmful to human health. They also attracted rodents and encouraged the growth of bacteria. It served as the plague's all-inclusive resort. Europeans were aware of the Black Plague's contagious nature when it first appeared. To protect their populace, some cities attempted to divert ships that had visited infected areas. In order to ensure that ships and travelers weren't infected, Venice was the first to impose a 30-day isolation period in 1348. Later plague outbreaks caused the city to extend isolation to 40 days, giving rise to the term quarantine, which comes from the Italian word quaranta, which means 40. Unfortunately, despite all these efforts, the disease continued to spread. Still, tens of thousands died in Venice. Guy de Chaliac, the physician to Pope Clement VI claimed that the epidemic made European doctors look bad. For fear of contracting the illness, they dared not visit the sick. When they did visit, they did very little to help them. Pope Clement VI was told by de Chaliac to sit by himself between two bonfires. According to the doctor, this procedure would purify the air and guard against infection. It's possible that the fire's unintended effect was to scare away rats carrying the plague but when coupled with this compelling seclusion, it kept the Pope free of the plague. Tens of millions of Europeans perished in the Black Plague, but the deadliest epidemic in history also had an unexpected benefit, at least for those who lived. Dr. Sharon DeWitt's research shows that those who survived the plague had better health and lived longer. People's diets improved for 200 years afterward, and they lived longer than pre-plague Europeans. Scholars suggest a number of explanations as to why the improvements occurred. The smaller population that emerged after the plague benefited from higher wages and lower food costs, which helps to account for healthier diets. Additionally, given that the plague killed so many people, plague survivors may have been more resilient. Thanks for sticking around until the end. Have you ever wondered what it was like living in Europe during the Black Plague? We've taken a look at the gross hygiene habits during this time and how they played a role in managing the epidemic. From bathing in vinegar and rose water to covering the floor with straw and rushes, we've seen some of the attempts made to control the spread of the plague. We've also discussed the importance of evidence-based medicine, the consequences of baseless accusations, and the unexpected benefit of surviving the plague. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like leave a comment and subscribe to this channel for more fascinating and surprising happenings in our history. See you in our next video.